All right, um, let's get started here. Welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you uh, join us here this afternoon. Um, this is the first of hopefully many of the Twilight Talk uh, webinars. Uh, the background here is um, that we were trying to put up or uh, organize a summer school this summer on measuring natural illumination, all the things that are associated with this. Um, and unfortunately, this obviously had to be canceled. So what we're trying to do is here to, to do here is provide a kind of alternative program that I think will be of interest to many other people as well. Um, just a little bit about the Daylight Academy. It's an international membership organization. Um, it's been around since 2016. Um, and it's really there to kind of connect scientists, architects, and other really uh, professionals with a strong interest in daylight related topics. And that goes from really, you know, use of daylight in architecture to, you know, physiological responses to light. Um, one of its core tenets is to really encourage creativity and innovation through this interdisciplinary approach, but then also disseminate knowledge to the public and really kind of spread the word about daylight among specialists, but then also with the public. Um, just before we get started, I just wanna uh, let you know that we have another uh, webinar coming up. So if you haven't registered yet, please feel free to do so. We'll be learning about how the sun paints the sky. Now, throughout the webinar today, um, we'll ask you to, so if you're interested in asking a question, please do use the Q&A function in Zoom. It's different from the chat function. So in the chat function, you can chat, but if you wanna ask a question for, for the speaker, please use the Q&A function. And after the talk, um, we'll basically go through the, the questions um, uh, one by one um, until we've kind of uh, completed the hour. Um, there is the option to kind of upvote or thumbs up specific questions. So if there's something that you'd really like to see answered, uh, please use that and say, yeah, I, I really wanna, wanna see this. And then we can prioritize the question, the Q and A session afterwards based on, the, based on your vote effectively. Now, let's talk about the speaker. So if you've worked on the effects of light on, uh, uh, on circadian rhythms, you'll surely have come across Tiffany Schmidt's research. Um, it's really, really uh, cutting edge and, and at, the, at the frontier of knowledge. Um, she, Tiffany Schmidt obtained her PhD at the University of Minnesota and then went on to do a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University in Baltimore with Samara Hatta. And in 2014, she started her own lab at the Department of Neurobiology uh, at Northwestern University, where she is currently a tenured professor. Over her career, she's made significant contributions in sensory research and, and circadian biology and has been published in numerous high profile journals. Um, her contributions have also been recognized, including the NIH uh, Director's uh, New Innovator Award, as well as the Pizard Award for Outstanding Achievements in Vision Science, awarded by the Lighthouse Guild. We feel very privileged to have been able to win Tiffany over as a speaker for the first ever Twilight Talk. Um, and without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tiffany. Um, Tiffany, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you so much. It took no convincing to get me to agree to give this talk. I'm a big fan of yours. And uh, I think this is, this is a great series to do and taking advantage of the situation that we're all in, but at least now we can talk to more people virtually. So what I would like to do today is um, cover, you know, some of what our lab has been working on and tell you also just about the system that we've been working in to sort of introduce you if you're going to see a lot of these series about where this light reception really starts, which is in the retina with these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that I'll talk about today, at least when we're thinking about how light affects our circadian and non-image forming systems. And so I've had a longstanding interest in really understanding how light affects our behavior and our physiology. And I find this to be such a fascinating question because light affects our physiology and behavior in so many different ways. So we're all very familiar with the fact that you need light to see, but of course we also need light for things like regulating our sleep-wake cycles and activities, um, our hormonal rhythms. Light even affects our ability to learn and our mood, anxiety levels, etc. And this is becoming an increasingly important thing to understand, I think, in modern society, because instead of just being exposed to this very regular light dark cycle that's dictated by the sun with electricity, smartphones, etc., we're now all able to expose ourselves to light at all of the wrong times of day. And evidence is beginning to accumulate that these aberrant light exposures are also really detrimental for our health. And so I would argue that understanding the basic function of these circuits is more important than ever. And that's really what we've been trying to understand all the way from the retina to um, behavior. So today I'm gonna to tell you about one of our more recent studies um, that was just published earlier this summer. Um, and so um, light exerts all of these influences that I just mentioned. 
solely through the visual system in mammals. And it does so through basically two distinct streams. So image forming vision involves what you think of when you think of sight, which is the detection and perception of color, contrast, form, and motion. Uh, and then you have your non-image forming visual system. And this involves those functions that occur outside of your conscious perception. So one of the best studied of these and probably very familiar to this audience is a process called circadian photoentrainment, where organisms will align their daily activity and physiology rhythms to that external environmental light dark cycle. And another very important non-image forming function is the pupillary light reflex, where organisms constrict their pupil in response to an increase in environmental light. And this is something you probably take completely for granted until you go to the eye doctor, have your pupils dilated, and you can't see a thing. And that's because this pupillary light reflex is really critical for allowing you to see over the more than billion fold change in light intensity that you would encounter from starlit night to bright sunny day, you know, at noon. And so all this information is started, it's the process by which it gets to the visual system is starting right in the retina, which is this beautifully organized layered structure that sits at the back of the eye and consists of six different types of neurons. So as light comes into your eye, it's focused by your cornea and your lens onto your retina, passes through all of the inner retinal layers towards the front of the eye, all the way to the back of the eye where it hits the outer segments of these rod and cone photoreceptors. And these rods and cones will then transduce that light information into an electrochemical signal that's relayed via this network of interneurons in the retina onto the retinal ganglion cells of the ganglion cell layer. And these ganglion cells are the axon bearing cells of the retina that then send their axons to a multitude of downstream targets in the brain. I'm actually only showing you a subset. Ganglion cells project to more than 40 different brain regions where um, and each of these brain regions that they project to is thought to be involved in a different subset of those light evoked effects on our behavior and our physiology. Right, so for example, we have areas of the brain that are devoted to various non-image forming functions. So relating these to the two behaviors I told you about earlier, the core of the olivary pretectal nucleus, sorry, the shell of the olivary pretectal nucleus is the structure responsible for driving pupil constriction in response to light. And then you have the central circadian pacemaker, this suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And this is really your body's master circadian pacemaker and it's responsible for synchronizing all the other clocks in your body to this one pacemaker. And then light information comes in from the retina to the SCN. And it's that light input from the retina that's responsible for photo entraining that circadian rhythm to that external environmental light dark cycle to drive circadian photo entrainment. You have other multiple other structures involved in non-image forming functions um, involving how light affects mood, sleep, um, et cetera. Now you also have structures of the brain devoted to image formation. So areas such as the superior colliculus and dorsolateral geniculate nucleus are really two of the key structures involved in your visual perception or what we call pattern vision. And so for a long time, we really thought that this was kind of how things worked. We have this division of image and non-image forming vision really occurring at the level of the brain and which brain structures drive those behaviors. And then the light detection being done solely by those rod and cone photoreceptors. However, it started to become clear to clinicians, in fact, first, that this really wasn't likely to be the whole story. So what doctors began to notice was that they would have patients come in that had degeneration of their rods and cones, right? So they lacked rod and cone photoreceptors, which were the only light sensitive cells in the retina. But somehow those patients were still showing the ability for their non-image forming functions to function relatively normally. So I'll show you an example of some of this work from Chuck Seisler's group at Harvard back in the 90s. So what they did was measure melatonin rhythms. So a normally sighted subject will have melatonin, which is this sleep hormone, uh, be high at night and low during the day. And another feature of this is that if their melatonin is high and you give a patient or a person a light pulse, you'll see this rather fast and substantial decrease in their um, melatonin levels um, right here in response to a light pulse. This is also why it's really bad to look at your phone in the middle of the night because this is what will happen to your melatonin levels, right? Not very good for sleep. Um, and then you can see that those melatonin levels will go sort of back up once the light turns off. 
So what they did then was the same experiment in patients lacking functional rods and cones, the only known photoreceptors in the retina. And what they saw was that these blind patients were showing a normal rise in melatonin when the lights turned off at night and a normal decrease in melatonin during the day. And these patients were even able to show that transient decrease in melatonin if you gave them a light pulse in the middle of the night. So how do you have people who are completely cognitively blind? They tell you they have no light perception. They can't tell you how bright the lights are. They aren't seeing anything. They're lacking all known photoreceptors and yet you still clearly have a light response. And this was gone in patients who had had their eyes removed. And this coupled with the generation of some mouse models that sort of recapitulated the human phenotype really clued researchers into the fact that there must be a third class of photoreceptors in the mammalian retina that we had been missing. So David Burson's group was really, I would say, the first to discover these cells, and they decided to hone in on the cells that projected to this central circadian pacemaker. It was really a simple and elegant approach because they noticed that these blind patients had functional circadian photoentrainment of their melatonin rhythm, so they looked at the central pacemaker, which is, of course, responsible for circadian photoentrainment. And they decided to look at the cells that projected to this central circadian pacemaker, these SCN projecting retinal ganglion cells. And so to do this, they used rats, they placed a dye coated bead into the SCN of these rats. What this then allowed them to do was put the dye into the axons of any ganglion cells that projected to the SCN. It would travel back to the cell bodies of these cells and label them with fluorescence, which is what you're seeing here in panel B. What they could then do was take the retina out of these animals and look in the retina for dye labeled cells and they knew that those were the SCN projecting ganglion cells. They can then patch onto these cells to perform electrophysiological recordings and see if these cells, uh, how these cells responded to light. So when they did that, this is, this is what they saw. So if we look first at the top panel in the black trace, if you record from one of these SCN projecting ganglion cells in current clamp, um, this is what it would look like. If you turn on the light, which is what this step is here, you would see that ganglion cell depolarize by your action potentials. And you would see that that ganglion cell sustains its depolarization even after the lights have gone off. In fact, long after the lights have gone off. Now seeing a ganglion cell respond to a light stimulus is not that unexpected because of course, all ganglion cells are getting input from these rod and cone photoreceptors. However, what they did next was silence all of that input from the rod and clone photoreceptors using pharmacology, which is what you're seeing in the red traces in the top two panels here. And you can see that even in the absence of any rod or cone input, those SCM projecting ganglion cells continue to respond to light with that same sustained depolarization that persisted following stimulus offset, suggesting that they can respond to light in the absence of any rod or cone input. And in fact, they even took the soma, the cell body of these cells, and physically isolated it from the retinal tissue. And what they found was that when you flashlight on the isolated soma of these cells, it also would depolarize in the absence now physically of any possible input from the rod or cone photoreceptors. So what this told them was that these ganglion cells were in fact intrinsically photosensitive. So they called them intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which is a mouthful. So we call them IPRGCs, which is still a mouthful, but it's a little better. Um, and so we now know that these IPRGCs are that third class of photoreceptor um, that were likely functional in these blind patients. And they're physically separate from these outer retinal rods and cones located here in the ganglion cell layer and talk directly to the brain. Now the protein that allows these IPRGCs to respond directly to light is what's called a photopigment. And this photopigment is called melanopsin or OPN4. This photopigment is just like the photopigments you see in rods or cones. It's a seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptor. This particular photopigment has a maximum sensitivity to blue light at 480 nanometers. So those of you that work in the lighting industry and when you're thinking about blue light and it's alerting effects, um, these are those cells that are most sensitive to blue light in the retina. So what this means is that IPRGCs are actually bona fide photoreceptors. They respond directly to light. They don't need the rods or cones to do this. But what makes them really interesting cell type to study is that they're also bona fide ganglion cells. And what I mean by that is that they are constantly receiving, just like all other ganglion cells, input from the rod and cone photoreceptors relayed from the outer retina. And so unlike any other ganglion cell, 
these IPRGCs are constantly integrating that extrinsic rod and cone signal with their intrinsic, very slow, very sustained melanopsin signal. And this property alone makes them a really interesting one to study. And another important point about why these cells are really amazing to study for visual circuits is that because we have this melanopsin gene that's expressed only in these cells, the field has been able to um, generate just a myriad mouse models to label, manipulate, and ablate these cells. So we can really use them as a way to understand visual circuits and behavior at a fairly specific um, level. So if you look at the projections of IPRGCs versus conventional ganglion cells, um, superimposed on that picture I showed you at the beginning, we find that IPRGCs project to more than 15 of the 40 or so brain areas that ganglion cells actually project to. Right? So you can see here lots of these non-image forming brain areas and then a mix of IPRGC and conventional ganglion cell input in other areas. And so one of the places they, one of the sort of categories where they innervate brain areas most strongly is just the broad category of non-image forming brain regions. If I sort of blur out the more image forming regions, you can see a lot is left and most of it is IPRGC innervated. So they are really sort of the primary or sole innervator of a lot of these non-image forming brain regions uh, with a few exceptions. And that includes the areas of the brain involved in pupil constriction, this shell of the olivary pretectal nucleus and circadian photo entrainment, this um, um, suprachiasmatic nucleus. And in fact, if you use um, a mouse line to ablate the IPRGCs, this is work from Samra Hattar's lab done by Ali Guler, who has his own lab now at UVA. If you ablate these IPRGCs and you lose the projections of IPRGCs to all of these non-image forming brain regions, what you find is doing that results in basically a complete loss of an animal to constrict its pupil or to photo entrain. So really what this tells us is that these cells are the sole conduit through which at least the pupillary light reflex and circadian photo entrainment occur, increasing evidence points to them being also the sole conduit for, for example, the ab effects of aberrant light on mood, uh, perhaps during shift work or seasonal light changes. So IPRGCs are required for these non-image forming functions. They also turn out to be important for pattern vision, which is less relevant to today's talk, so I'm not gonna go into any details here, but suffice it to say that we now know that IPRGCs combine their inputs with those of conventional ganglion cells to drive pattern vision. And what's worth noting here is that IPRGCs appear to be a really well-conserved cell type across multiple species, both in terms of the existence of subtypes, how they signal, and the types of behaviors they drive. So where, we, where researchers have looked in non-human primates and humans, it seems like IPRGCs are playing some of these same roles in both image and non-image forming vision. So this is one reason we like these cells to study visual circuits because they're involved in so many various visual circuits and we have such amazing tools to manipulate these cells. And so the work I wanna to talk to you about today is really looking at how ganglion cells signal to the brain. And this was a rather broad question that we started off with that had nothing necessarily to do with IPRGCs that ended up circling right back to this cell type. And this was work undertaken by an incredibly talented, now former PhD student in the lab, um, Dr. Takuma Sonoda, who's currently a postdoc at Harvard. And this work was just published in May and was done with the help of uh, two undergrads in the lab, Jenny and Yudai, and a really talented rotation student, um, Nick Hayes, who's in the neuroscience PhD program. And so we just wanted to know how are ganglion cells signaling to their downstream targets in the brain? When you look up this question in a textbook, what you'll find is that ganglion cells release glutamate at all of their downstream targets in the brain. Right, so the, um, and glutamate, for those of you who might not know, is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So when a cell releases it on its downstream target, that will excite the postsynaptic cell and basically sends a go signal. And it was really thought for a long time that this was the neurotransmitter used by ganglion cells at both image forming brain regions like the LGN and non-image forming brain regions like the olivary pretectal nucleus and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And people thought this because there's a lot of really great evidence that ganglion cells do release glutamate. And I'm just gonna show you two examples. So if you look in an image forming brain region in the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus, this is work from Chin Fei Chen's lab, you can label ganglion cell terminals with YFP, which is what you're seeing here in green, 
And you can immunostain for something called vesicular glutamate transporter 2 or VGLUT2, which is a marker of glutamatergic neurons. If you do that, what you'll find is that there's really good overlap between ganglion cell terminals and VGLUT2, suggesting that these are glutamatergic ganglion cells. Likewise, if you look in a non-image forming brain region, the SCN, this is work from Diego Fernandez in Samra Hattar and Alan Chen's lab, you will find IPRGC terminals here labeled in red, co-localizing really nicely with um, this VGLUT2 protein. So in both types of brain regions, the, there appear to be uh, glutamatergic ganglion cells. However, if you start to look back in the literature a ways, you will find indications that at least some ganglion cells might contain GABA. So here's an example on the left from the ground scroll retina where ganglion cells have been retrogradely labeled from the superior colliculus, which is what's in the right panel. If you immunolabel those ganglion cells for GAD, which is a GABA synthesis enzyme, you will find cells that are positive for GAD. And GABA release from IPRGC, or from ganglion cells at all would be significant because GABA basically does the opposite of what glutamate does. It basically sends a stop signal. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, so its effects would be completely in opposition to what we think that ganglion cells do. Additionally, if you look in the optic nerve of multiple species, including rabbit, rat, and cat, you will find some ganglion cells that are positive for GABA. So looking back in the literature, this is all on Takuma for finding this, you can find indications that at least some ganglion cells might contain GABA. So we started to wonder, well, do they? Where do they go? What do they actually release GABA? What are their influences on behavior? And so we started with a really simple experiment to just check for the existence at all of potentially GABAergic ganglion cells. And the experiment was as follows. So we took a GAD2 Cree line, which is a mouse where Cree recombinase is expressed in the locus of this GABA synthesis enzyme, GAD2. And we took an I injected a virus with a Cree dependent label of TD tomato so that we could visualize the axons of any cells that express GAD2. And because we know that the only cells sending axons from the eye to the brain are ganglion cells, any axons we see in the brain using this paradigm, we can be confident arise from GAD2 positive ganglion cells. So we injected the mice, we waited about a month, and then we looked in the brains of these animals. And surprisingly, frankly, but actually very excitingly, we did consistently see in 14 of 14 animals, GAD2 positive axons in visual areas in the brain. And what was even more interesting was that these projections seemed largely confined to areas of the brain involved in non-image forming functions. So if you look here in the intergeniculate leaflet and ventrolateral geniculate nucleus, you see axons, you can see clearly a lot of innervation in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, and so those are all circadian brain regions. Additionally, if you look in the shell of the olivary pretectal nucleus, which I told you is important for the pupillary light reflex, you also see really nice innervation of those structures. So now we're confident that some GAD2 expressing ganglion cells seem to exist in the retina. And our next question was, well, what type of ganglion cells might this be? Well, the other thing I've already told you is that these are actually major targets of these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And so we decided to test whether these GAD2 positive ganglion cells are in fact IPRGCs. So to do this, we did an almost identical experiment to the one I just told you. We took the GAD2 Cree mouse and we I injected a Cree dependent reporter, this time M. Cherry. And instead of taking a look at the brains, this time we took a look at the retinas. So any M cherry positive cells are GAD2 positive cells. And we then immunolabeled those retinas for our IPRGC marker, melanopsin. So if IPRGCs contain GAD2, then we should be able to detect GAD, or, um, melanopsin positive, M cherry double positive cells in the retina. And that turns out to be exactly what we see. So if you look here at the top panels first, what you see is that when we um, perform this experiment, we get lots of M cherry positive cells in the ganglion cell layer. Most of these probably come from the GABAergic amacrine cells that reside in that cell layer that don't send axons to the brain. But we did notice that in the dorsal temporal retina, our melanopsin immunopositive cells quite often co-localize with our GAD2 marker M cherry. You can see that here in the merged image. <clears throat> 
Interestingly, when we looked in other quadrants of the retina, the co-localization became much more rare. So here you can see an example of five IPRGCs in this quadrant, none of which co-label with the MCHERRY GAD2 reporter. So if we do sort of a total co-localization percentage, it turns out to be about 12% of the IPRGCs labeling with our GAD2 marker. But if you break it down by quadrant, what you see is that about 30% of IPRGCs in this dorsal temporal, which is up here, uh, quadrant, co-label with GAD2, whereas in the other three quadrants, this is a much rarer occurrence. And we still don't understand why, this, um, why there's this regional specificity, but it was really reproducible across um, multiple retinas. And if we, it's also worth noting that if we did this same experiment, but with a general marker for all ganglion cells or different subsets of ganglion cells, the percentage of co-localization was usually less than 1%. So this does seem to be a specific enrichment of this GAD2 in the IPRGCs themselves. So that was all well and good, but we had been using a Cree mouse line and that's always a little bit iffy in terms of whether it's faithfully reporting the expression of the gene that it's supposed to report. And so we wanted to know whether IPRGCs actually contained the mRNA for this uh, gene GAD2. So this is where Nick comes in and he did some really nice RNA scope SM fish experiments. So fluorescence in situ hybridization. So what you're seeing here is just one of my favorite images that we've ever generated. And it's just a section from a mouse retina as you go from front to back. You get this beautiful circle and you can really nicely see here the ganglion cell layer, the inner nuclear layer, as well as the outer nuclear layer where the rod and comb photoreceptors are um, all really clearly labeled. And so what we can do then is uh, perform fish and look for probe for melanopsin mRNA as well as the GAD2 mRNA and see if these two things overlap in the same cells, just like we did for the immunostaining. So here's a zoom in of those three layers, ganglion cell layer, inner nuclear layer, outer nuclear layer. You can see GAD2 all over the inner nuclear layer and in the ganglion cell layer, likely due to expression in amacrine cells. But then what we see is that we have cells that are melanopsin positive. So these are IPRGCs. And if we zoom in, we see examples of both GAD2 positive and GAD2 negative IPRGC. So here's an example cell, um, DAPI is just a nuclear marker. Uh, here's an example melanopsin positive cell that contains a lot of GAD2. Um, when you merge them, you can see that really clearly. Whereas here on the bottom, you can see an example of an IPRGC that really contains no GAD2. Um, so we call this a GAD2 negative IPRGC. And even with really non-stringent criteria for what constitutes a GAD2 positive cell, we find only 26% of the melanopsin positive cells contain GAD2 mRNA. So again, it's a really small subset of IPRGCs that actually contain um, GAD2. So that's the mRNA. What about the actual protein for this GABA synthesis enzyme? The protein for GAD2 is called GAD65. And so we decided to look for GAD65 where it's usually found, which is in the axon terminals of cells that release GABA. And we use two different methods that I'm not gonna go into details about now, but happy to at the end, to just label gang IPRGC axons in the SCN. And um, that's what the synaptophysin TV tomato signal is. So you can see nice labeling of IPRGC axons. If we zoom in now here in this um, box, you can see IPRGC axons labeled in green, the GAD65 protein labeled in magenta, and synapsin, which is a presynaptic marker marker labeled with cyan. So what this allows us to do is see, is there GAD65 at synapses in IPRGCs? So if you zoom in on each of these three boxes, what you find is again, examples of GAD65 positive and GAD65 negative IPRGC terminals. So here in boxes one and two, you have IPRGC terminal. We know it's a synaptic, uh, likely a synaptic contact because we have synapse in here. And you can see that these two terminals are GAD65 positive. And here in box three, you can see an IPRGC terminal synapsin is present, but there's no GAD65. So we used an automated algorithm to quantify this. And in both of the approaches that we used, we found that 12% of IPRGC terminals in the SCN were positive for GAD65, which basically exactly matches what we saw when we looked in the retina um, in the GAD2 Cree line. If we do a rotation control where we take one channel and rotate it 90 degrees, that co-localization goes away. And that co-localization also goes away if we 
remove the GAD2 gene specifically in IPRGC. So we're confident that our labeling for GAD65 is actually labeling that protein and also that the co-localization is real. So these IPRGCs do actually seem to contain GABA. It seems to be the IPRGCs that innervate these non-image forming brain regions, or they at least contain the machinery to make GABA. And so we can confidently say that IPRGCs are GAD2 positive. But really the next most important question was, do they actually release that GABA? Do they make it? Do they release it? Are they in fact a functionally GABAergic neuron? And we decided to look at this question in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of mice, and we decided to use an optogenetics-based circuit tracing approach. And so what we did here was express this light-gated channel, channel rhodopsin, in all IPRGCs. When light hits channel rhodopsin, it opens the channel and excites whatever neuron is expressing that channel rhodopsin, so in this case, IPRGCs. By doing this, what you can do is put this light-sensitive channel into the IPRGC axons at all of their target brain regions. And if we then take a brain slice that contains the SCN, that SCN slice will contain not only the SCN, but also these now light-sensitive IPRGC axons. What we can then do is record from the SCN neurons themselves, flashlight onto our slice, which will evoke synaptic release from our channel rhodopsin, channel rhodopsin expressing IPRGC terminals. And if they are releasing neurotransmitter onto this SCN neuron, they'll evoke a response. By using voltage clamp at different holding potentials, what we can do is determine whether that transmitter release from IPRGCs is glutamate and excitatory or GABA and inhibitory. Okay, and so this is, this is an example of what this would look like. So if you excite an IPRGC terminal and it's connected to the SCN neuron and it's releasing glutamate, what you would see is if you record at minus 60 millivolts, what's called an excitatory postsynaptic current, which would indicate glutamate release from IPRGCs. Um, whereas if you recorded at zero millivolts to isolate any inhibitory inputs, you wouldn't see anything. Another possibility would be that we would see only an inhibitory response in that SCN neuron, right? So now you see no excitatory postsynaptic current, but you do see what's called an inhibitory postsynaptic current or IPSC. That would indicate GABA release from IPRGCs. A third possibility is that you will record from these, we would record from these SCN neurons and see both an excitatory postsynaptic current and an inhibitory postsynaptic current. For any of the aficionados in the audience, we recorded all of these responses in TTX and 4AP to ensure that all the connections we were actually looking at were monosynaptic, so coming from the IPRGC onto that SCN neuron itself. So this experiment should tell us if IPRGCs functionally release GABA because we should see one of these two possibilities right here. And excitingly, that is exactly what we saw when we looked in the SCN. So here's one class of uh, responses that we saw in the SCN neurons where they responded with only an IPSC, an inhibitory postsynaptic current, but no excitatory response, suggesting they're receiving solely GABAergic input from these IPRGCs. We also saw a large proportion of SCN neurons that got input from IPRGCs that responded to both a GABAergic signal and a glutamatergic signal from IPRGCs. So they were getting both excitatory glutamatergic input and inhibitory GABAergic input from these cells. And we saw a class, a class of SCN neurons that received no inhibitory input from IPRGCs, but did get excitatory input from IPRGCs. Based on the textbook, we would have expected to see only these EPSCs when we excited IPRGC axons, but we in fact saw all three classes of responses, suggesting that IPRGCs are functionally releasing GABA um, at their downstream targets in the brain. So if we break down what we actually saw here, we found that of all the SCN neurons that responded, about half of them got at least some inhibitory input from these GABAergic IPRGCs. Okay, so they are functionally releasing GABA. And if we put the pharmacological blockers on that would block glutamate or GABA, we see that they block what we would expect. So we're confident that this is in fact GABA release from IPRGCs. So now we know that these IPRGCs do functionally release GABA in the SCN, but it's still a relatively small population of IPRGCs that seem to contain GAD2 
And so we really wanted to understand whether this was functionally relevant for visual behaviors. And what was nice was that we happened to know back one, what these two brain regions that get this input from IPRGCs do. We know that the OPN is important for pupil constriction. We know that the SCN is important for circadian photoentrainment. We can very easily measure those behaviors in the lab. So we decided to start by looking at what GABA release from IPRGCs might do to affect pupil constriction. Because remember, we had innervation of the shell of the OPN, which is important for pupil constriction. So we decided to measure pupil constriction across a wide range of light intensities in animals that lacked the GAD2 gene, GAD2 flox animals, specifically in IPRGCs. So to do this, we crossed melanopsin Cree to these GAD2 flox animals. We compared their pupil constriction with those of control uh, littermate animals, which were GAD2 flox flox with no, with no Cree. And to measure the pupil, it's actually very simple. You manually restrain the mouse, you record the pupil diameter of one eye, and you shine light of different intensities um, on the other eye after a period of dark adaptation. So when you do that experiment, this is what a control animal's pupillary light response looks like. So here on the y-axis, you have normalized pupil area. So this is a wide open pupil here at one, completely closed pupil at zero, and light intensity is increasing um, here on the x-axis from left to right. So this would be starlight all the way to very bright daylight. And as you present an animal with brighter and brighter light, its pupil diameter gets smaller and smaller, so it shows more pupil constriction. And you can see here what a wide open mouse pupil looks like. You can see in dim light, it partially constricts, and in bright light, that's fully constricted for a mouse pupil. So that's the controls. What do these GAD2 animals look like? Are they any different? Well, the answer in bright light was they're not different at all. It's exactly the same as what we see in the control animals. But very interestingly, when we looked in the lower light intensities, what we saw was that animals that lacked GABA synthesis in IPRGCs showed better pupil constriction in dim light. So their pupils actually constricted more at low light, which you can see here in the raw image of the dim light constriction. So what this suggests is that in a control animal, in a wild type animal, that GABA release from IPRGCs is actually preventing the pupils from constricting in dim light. And this makes some sense to me because you don't actually want your pupil to constrict in starlight, for example. In starlight, you want those pupils wide open so that you can maximize photon capture so that you can actually see, right? So you need to prevent that somehow. And we think that maybe this GABA release from IPRGCs is at least one mechanism for preventing pupil constriction in low light. Okay, so that's pupil constriction. What about an SCN dependent behavior? So we have GABA release from IPRGCs decreasing the sensitivity of the pupillary light reflex. Does it do something similar for circadian photoentrainment, this SCN dependent behavior? So remember we had really nice innervation of the SCN by GAD2 positive IPRGCs. And we can measure circadian photoentrainment very easily using uh, voluntary wheel running behavior in different light dark cycles. And so we again compared these GAD2 conditional knockout animals to the photoentrainment of their control um, littermates. And we used a paradigm similar to what we, taking our cue from our pupillary light reflex experiments. Um, so we designed a paradigm similar to that where we uh, photo and train these animals to different light intensities. So this is an actogram. This is the type of data you get from these experiments. So we put these animals in a 12-12 light dark cycle. So 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. These are double plotted. So you have day one and two on the first line, day two and three on the second, day three and four. So that you can just visualize the data a little bit better. And we started with 100 lux of light and then um, 12 hours of darkness. And all of the black ticks are wheel revolutions for the mice. And mice are nocturnal. So they will confine their activity to the dark portion of the light dark cycle. So we then shifted the dark cycle forward six hours and simultaneously decreased the light intensity. And then this causes the mice to have to re-entrain and lets us look at how well they re-entrain to this lower light intensity. We waited a few weeks and we did the same thing again but this time went down to 0.2 lux. You can see that control animals, the photo entrainment is still there. They're still able to photo entrain even at these very low light intensities, but it starts to get a little bit messy in terms of how well locked on to the onset of dark that they are. And this contrasts quite nicely, I think, with what these animals that lack GAD2 and IPRGCs look like, where you can see everything is just super clean. They photo entrain really well, even at these really low light intensities, 
of 0.2 lux when you compare them to control. So to quantify this in some way, we measured circadian amplitude, which is basically a measure of how well an animal photo entrains, higher is better. Um, and you can see that at 100 lux, these uh, control animals and their GAD2 conditional knockout litter mates showed no differences. However, at the lower light intensity, similar to what we saw in the pupillary light reflex experiments, the GAD2 conditional knockouts showed significantly higher circadian amplitude here and at 0.2 lux as well. So we can measure this a different way looking at just activity during the light phase. So mice should not be very active in the light phase, being nocturnal animals that like to avoid the light. And again, we see that in 100 lux, the control and GAD2 conditional knockouts are about the same. But when we start to get into lower light, the control animals start to be a little more active in the light. And these GAD2 conditional knockouts are significantly less active at both one and a half lux as well as um, 0.2 lux. So again, this suggests that when animals don't have GABA in their IPRGCs, they photo entrain better in low light. So in an intact animal, that means that this GABA release is actually preventing the animal's circadian rhythms from changing in response to a, light, a weak light stimulus. And this again makes some sense to me because you don't want your circadian system to shift every time something changes in the environment. That change in the lighting environment needs to be meaningful and sustained and big for the body to want to just reorganize all of the clocks from the SCN on down, right? So you need something to kind of put the brakes on until it's a bright enough and big enough change um, for the animal to really respond. So similar to our thinking for what's going on with the pupillary light reflex. And so what I've shown you today is that IPRGCs are functionally releasing GABA to dampen the sensitivity of non-image forming behaviors. So we have IPRGCs that are labeled in a GAD2 Cree line. We have GAD2 positive ganglion cells innervating non-image forming brain regions. These IPRGCs are functionally releasing GABA in the SCN. And this GABA release is really dampening the sensitivity of these non-image forming behaviors. And what I liked about these findings, we had no idea what we were gonna find when we looked at the behavior because we had absolutely no idea what GABA release from ganglion cells would do. But what this ended up doing for me was answering a longstanding question that I've had, which is why are these non-image forming behaviors so very insensitive to light? When if I go and record from a ganglion cell in the retina, they are all incredibly sensitive to light. You can give a ganglion cell a really low light stimulus and that ganglion cell will respond, but that does somehow not translate to these non-image forming behaviors. And so this might be one mechanism by which the system is kind of putting the brakes on this very sensitive ganglion cell response by having that first signal that comes in dim light be an inhibitory one. Um, and so to me, that was kind of an answer to a puzzle. Now there's a lot of new puzzles to figure out, which is what I'm really excited to look at. Um, we wanna know things about, you know, how are these circuits actually working? How does this GABA release cause the behaviors that it causes? Which ganglion cells in particular are GABAergic in the retina? Um, which I appear to see subtypes, what are their properties? Um, so there's a lot of really amazing things I think to do going forward. Um, and we're really excited to figure out, you know, some new circuits with a new neurotransmitter in mind. So I wanna just thank the people who did the work, most of which was done by um, Takuma here, who was just incredibly talented and productive and has, I think, a really bright future ahead of him. Um, but also um, Yudai and Jenny and Nick, all who contributed substantially to the paper and collaborators who contributed a really critical reagent and also really critical analysis algorithm without which I think the paper would have been much less rigorous and much less quantitative. And so we're really grateful for um, their help as well. And then finally, I wanna thank um, our funding sources, including new funding from the NIH to actually pursue this work further and start to figure out some of those really interesting questions um, going forward. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Tiffany, for this really, really illuminating talk. Um, we have uh, a bunch of questions that um, people ask throughout the talk and basically we'll, we'll kind of uh, just go through them until we run out of time. Um, so the first question, so, and for anyone who wants to ask a question as well, please, you know, do put them in the Q&A function, right? So I see a couple of questions popping up in the, in the chat. Make sure you use the Q&A function so we can prioritize the questions. Also to just go through the, you know, uh, 
you can upvote questions if you like. So if there's a question you'd like to see answered, use that function. So the first question comes from Tariq Youssef uh, from Dalhousie University on the East Coast of Canada. And uh, they're saying, really interesting to see you discuss these very cool findings. Any thoughts on the Morvan paper, which concluded that retrograde IPRGC contacts weren't responsible for dopamine release in light, but it was rather rods that are responsible in different light adaptation, adaptation states. Any chance that IPRGCs also retro, retrogradely release uh, GABA into the inner nuclear layer, out of plexiform layer to provide negative feedback onto the retinal interneurons? That is a really cool idea. So I, first, with regards to the rod functioning in the dopamine release, I, I think our findings kind of agree with her when we looked in development the only manipulation that seemed to affect the dopaminergic amacrine cell development was when we messed with rod signaling. So I think that that is true in terms of the light evoke signals, at least the ones that are the strongest, but I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't like gone back and thought about it in the context of GABA release. And that would be interesting to record from the dopaminergic amacrine cells and see if you can get an inhibitory response um, from the IPRGCs, because I don't know which subset actually connect to the dopaminergic amacrine cells and if it's these GABA urgic ones, but that's a really, that's a good thought. I like that, thanks. Great, um, next question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, could you comment on whether you expect these GABA findings and behaviors to also hold in humans? So I think it is, if it's ever gonna be likely for a ganglion cells functions and behavior to translate to humans, I think it's with IPRGCs. So I think it's at least a possibility and a strong one because, um, the GABA presence in ganglion cells seems to be occurring across multiple species at least. And so I would expect it to potentially happen in primate, non-human primates and humans. And all the other behaviors we've looked at so far that they're involved in seem to map on. So I would at least say that it's a possibility. Um, it's harder to look at without the genetics in a primate, but we could at least do like the RNA scope for GAD2, which is a really good idea. Great. Uh, next question from Ruth Kelly Waskett. Um, illuminance in Lux is based on the V lambda curve, which is the sensitivity function of the human visual system to light in the visible spectrum. Is there likely to be an effect when using photopic illuminance in mammalian research? Do mice have their own V lambda curve? They do. And I mean, the rod sensitivity, you know, in terms of photopigment and the melanopsin sensitivities in terms of their lambda maxes match pretty well. And then the cone, the M cones in mice aren't too far off. So I wouldn't expect it to be totally off, but you're right that Lux, actually I'm not a huge fan of using Lux because it's, it is based on a couple of different things that aren't necessarily similar between mice and humans. So for like the pupil, we use blue light so we can just measure the number of photons in the retina, we usually use photons of blue light as well. Um, so I'd expect it to be a little bit different, but the relationships between the different light intensities would at least hold up. Great. Um, next question from Jamie Zeitzer. Um, he wants to know, is the circadian difference just due to a difference in pupil function, i.e. different retinal illumination with the same corneal illumination and not due to anything with the N uh, SCN innovation? You know what, I don't, so my guess would be no, because it's a very long-term exposure to light. And so the amount of photons that they're getting over these multiple hours, I don't think is going to be that drastically different, but you are right that their baseline pupil constriction would be more open in the GAD2 positive cells. Although we haven't looked over the course of hours, whether things kind of start to constrict. So we're not sure about the sort of temporal dynamics, how long can GABA sustain um, the inhibition of the pupil. I know like if you take away glutamate um, from the pupil, then you, that, that really affects more of the short-term effects on pupil. And I would expect maybe GABA to do the same thing, but PCAP to step in and take over and maybe allow the pupil to constrict. So that's an important question. I don't think it's probably the primary driver, but it's, a, it's an important thing to consider for sure. Great. Uh, we have one question from Cyril Eleftherio. Um, uh, they want to know, is it possible that channel rhodopsin 2 expressing IPRGCs had abnormal signals during development since they expressed both types of opsins that were exposed to light in the retina and thus generated abnormal synaptic connections in central targets? Well, I will say that that could be true of any channel rhodopsin experiment and it's always an important thing to consider. Um, 
I will say that the cells didn't seem to, to die, right? Because they were still there. All the projections looked very normal. The kinetics of the responses looked very normal and we're never going to, um, and also the chanrodopsin is so insensitive to light relative to the light the mice are housed in, which is lower than hundred lux that I wouldn't expect that to be sort of chronically activating the chanrodopsin. And so we don't think like we're excitotoxicity causing excitotoxicity or something in these animals because the light intensity is just so low compared to what chanrodopsin itself needs. So as far as we can tell, everything's normal. Um, and we don't think we're activating the chanrodopsin. We did this experiment with a couple of different approaches, only one made it into the paper and we always got a similar proportion. So I doubt that it made them like turn on GABA and start releasing it since we could detect the GAD2 in non-chanrodopsin expressing um, animals. But. Great. Um, we got one question from Phil Suppo. Um, do you think there might be a variation in sensitivity at particular wavelengths of light in the expression of GABA compared to glutamate rather than just a response to illuminance? I doubt that the color, so they, all the evidence is that there's really only one melanopsin. There's different isoforms, but it shouldn't change their wavelength sensitivity. So I would expect the sensitivity to the wavelength to be the same. However, one really simple explanation for what we're seeing behaviorally is that the GABAergic IPRGCs are the most sensitive of the IPRGCs. The one experiment I really want to do is go into the retina and just do that experiment. It's not hard to do the same sort of dose response on the IPRGCs that we did in the pupillary light reflex and see if the ones that are GABAergic are just responding at lower light because then you could imagine that GABA signal is just the first one to arrive. And then once the less sensitive glutamatergic ones come in, they kind of swamp out the GABA signal and cause pupil constriction or uh, you know, the animal to respond for circadian wheel running. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, but I don't think it's a difference in the wavelength sensitivity per se. Great. Um, so I'm just going to keep keep asking these questions until we are not run out of time. Great. <laughs> um, Sarah Patterson wants to know, you mentioned it wasn't clear why GAD2 IPRGCs were located primarily in one region of the retina, but I'm curious if you have any idea, speculation on the potential benefits of this topography. Could there be some relationship to the mouse's behavior or environment? So one really interesting possibility someone posed to me at a meeting was that this is sort of the spot in the eye where that it might be a very visually salient part of the visual field for an animal because, you know, it's looking kind of down at the ground, it's getting beamed, you know, back up from whatever's bouncing from the sky. And so maybe that is just what you want to tune your visual system to because it might be the most relevant to the animal. And I have not thought of a way to test that. If anyone has any ideas, I would love to, because it's just, it's a really stark localization difference. And I don't know if it's something that happened by happenstance when the retina is developing, there's something that's just high that causes the GAD2 to turn on in these cells, or if it's something that's been kept because it's very useful. Um, I mean, it's clearly useful, but this localization is, is interesting. Yeah, we don't know. Great. Uh, next question from Lin Chi Zhang. Thanks for the great talk on the question on the function of inhibitory IPRGCs. I have a more general question uh, related to IPRGC function with both intrinsic melanopsin input and extrinsic cone rod input. Can you speculate why that's the case? Isn't the extrinsic input already uh, enough information uh, for purposes of circadian rhythm entrainment? So if you look, so one thing to remember is that if IPRGCs are releasing GABA, that GABA release will be evoked by either a melanopsin or a rod and cone signal, right? So it's just the, the cell itself. Regarding the synaptic versus melanopsin, you're right that if you take away rods and cones or you take away melanopsin, the animal will sort of grossly photo entrain normally, although the sensitivities at which it does so will be different. And so it's almost a separate question from the GABA, but the rod and cone and melanopsin responses do different things. The rods and cones are very fast, very spatially discrete, very temporally discrete. And the melanopsin response sort of tunes the properties of these ganglion cells over very long periods of time. So Takuma had another paper in uh, 2018 in Neuron looking at this in the M4 IPRGCs and basically found that the melanopsin signaling boosts the rod and cone signals and allows this cell to respond better to contrast. So you can have these sort of playing off of each other things that make the cell more efficient at what it's doing. Um, so they do, they do work together and they do different things. Good question. 
Um, one question, or actually two questions from Nina. It was a short Zach. Uh, she says, thank you for a beautiful talk. Two questions. One, have you ruled out the possibility that GABA in the IPRGCs is eliciting the EPSC as it can do in the developing brain? And then the second question is, is it possible that the GAT2 knockout mice have a higher sympathetic tone under dim light conditions and therefore less pupillary constriction? Is it reduced constriction or increased dilation in these mice? So first question is GABA excitatory. That's a really important question. The way we did our experiments in this paper, we had um, patched onto the cells in the intracellular. We knew what the reversal of the chloride concentration should be. So the EPSCs and IPSCs were definitely chloride versus cation. And so we can separate them that way. What those experiments don't tell us is whether if we leave the cell intact and we put GABA on that cell, is it going to excite the cell or inhibit the cell? And that's one of the very next things we're gonna look at is how do these SCN neurons respond to GABA when we're not changing what their actual intracellular concentration of ions is and just looking at it in a more intact way because the SCN can have different responses to GABA at different types of day, which is one of the um, things, yeah, one of the things we wanna look at, which is a great question. Regarding, oh, remind me of the last part of that last question was. Uh, the second question was, is it possible that GAD2 knockout mice have a higher sympathetic tone? Yeah, so what we know is that at least their, you know, their resting pupil constriction appears to be normal. We know we can, I think we put carbacol on and we can fully drive constriction of the pupils. And so that's, it shouldn't change sympathetic tone to just mess with, because we're doing it very specifically in IPRGCs. And we did that both with our melanopsin Cree, but also I didn't have time to talk about it, but we injected Cree into the eye and specifically knocked out GABA in ganglion cells and got a similar pupil result. So I, I don't think it's sympathetic um, tone, especially also with the circadian experiments it's matching, but that's a good question. Great, and then uh, one question from Nemanja Milicevic uh, from the University of Amsterdam. Can Mueller glia cells modulate the IPRGC response to light? Fabulous question. Nobody has really looked at the relationship between these cells and glia. And I think there's probably something interesting going on there. I know Bo Tondraska back in the day, like found if you put rabies virus or pseudo rabies virus in and got into IPR disease, you would see Mueller glia. So there seems to be some type of close apposition, if not connection between the two, but nobody's, nobody's looked and I bet they'll find something if they do. Great, and then one last question before we wrap up, uh, also from Nemanja. Uh, can other I RGCs compensate for IPRGC deficiencies such as an opium for knockout? Well, so if you kill the IPRGCs, like if you actually ablate them and remove their rod cone and melanopsin responses, you lose pupil constriction, you lose circadian photoentrainment, and you see deficits in their ability to see contrast. So if the cells are gone, that nothing can fully compensate for them being missing. If you just take out the rod and cone or the melanopsin and the IPRGCs are still there to relay something, then you see deficiencies, but you don't see a loss. So these cells themselves and the signals they relay, be it rod, cone or melanopsin are necessary for non-image forming functions and very important for image forming functions. Perfect, great. So that was the, the last question. Thank you again, Tiffany, for really presenting this really exciting research and, and uh, just keeping on, on answering the questions that I was throwing at you. Thank you so and much. Sure if anyone wants to continue the discussion, I'm happy to. So, <laughs> great. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to um, share the last slide so we can sort of wrap up. Um, so, thank you all for watching and participating. If you have any questions uh, you want to you want to chat about with respect to this webinar, feel free to reach out to the Daylight Academy office. And then, just one last thing that I want to um, announce is the next webinar, oops, the next webinar in this Twilight Talk series, and this is will be deli delivered by uh, Bob Fosbury uh, from the European Southern Observatory and University College London, and he'll be talking about how the sun paints the sky. And with that, uh, I want to thank everyone again, uh, and you're free to disconnect now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.